I can't think of a better way to end it than to have June give us a, a mind dump anyway, all the stuff we've been thinking about. So. Yes, that is exactly it. It will just be um, a mind dump, brain dump. Uh, I don't know actual content, but um, it's just stuff that I've been thinking about uh, from use our talk that we gave like a month ago and then our studio coming up. Um, and they've all been centering around this question of like trying to make internals a bit more accessible. Um, Cause like a big, big thing about like ggplot internals is that I think there's this like weird, weird like tension of like internals being very hard to access on the one hand and that hasn't really changed. But then at the same time, ggplot has been adding a lot of new features that like allow users to do more powerful things um, like the after stat function inside the AES, uh, for example, is one of the recent ones. Um, and so like the ability for users, like the, the capacities for users to do things has been slowly encroaching on like the internals area, such that like it would benefit you as a user if you also knew something about the internals. But then everything that's been written about the internals is all about like, here's how you can become an extension developer. Um, and so that's kind of what I want to talk about today. And I guess that will wrap the book. Um, and yeah, I can like just get started because um, the first few things that I want to talk about aren't like super new. Uh, but basically, um, let me see. Can you can you all see this OK? Uh, my R Studio, OK. Um, so what I've been thinking about is, so we have a plot that's like this, let's say it's a box plot of penguin species, you have species on X, um, you have the flipper length on Y, um, and you have a box plot for each species, uh, something that uh, apparently a lot of people didn't know was possible is that you can like annotate parts of these box plots like on the fly so there's like um i guess the, the the initial kind of thought that i had was like it's really easy for us to do certain things in ggplot but then some other things are very hard even though they might look trivial so it's very easy for me to just like make this box plot it took me you know like two lines of code um, and this just reads like a high level description of the plot, right? Like we don't have to think about how like medians and quartiles and whiskers are calculated. We don't have to think about how the box plots are drawn from the individual components like segments and boxes, like rectangles and points. Um, everything's just kind of abstracted away from us. And we write a code like this where it also just kind of, you can read it like plain English, like make a plot with the penguins data set with species variable mapped to the x and fill aesthetics and the flipper length variable mapped to the y aesthetic and then use geom box plot to draw the data and you get a plot back and that just reads like plain english um, and so ggplot is nice in that way such that you don't have to think about the implementational details of how like each layer comes to life but then once you start like caring about them like asking any kind of question about what is happening um, underlyingly, or like what's being calculated, what what values are being calculated. If the user, once the user starts asking those questions, then things get really complicated really fast. Um, and so like given this plot, we know we can like eyeball values of things like um, the median for the chin strap penguins, which is like, I guess around 195. Um, the value of how far this lower whisker extends to for the second box plot for chin straps, which is around 180. But if you want like exact values, that's like kind of harder to find. Um, and I, I feel like we don't do this often and maybe so like, you know, even for us, we went through the entire book and this isn't really discussed, like where do you go and find values that are being plotted if you didn't like provide it directly yourself. Um, and the answer is like kind of unexpected, which is that like if I save this to a variable called my box plot, you might think that the value that was calculated to draw the box plots, so like actual medians, quartiles, outliers, and whatnot, might live inside the ggplot object, and it it doesn't. So like you can inspect it using like the str str function to look at the structure of this object. 
um, and, and it won't have what you're looking for. It doesn't have values for things like the quartiles and the whiskers. Um, and the reason why is because our code, um, ggplot code that we write, uh, when it gets evaluated, it just amounts to like being like the instructions for plotting and it's not like the plot itself. So like this isn't a plot, it's instructions for the plot. And we only think that the plot itself is stored in this variable because when we print it, we get a plot back. But that's just like a side effect of printing a ggplot object, which is, you know, print the print method for objects with class ggplot is defined here. Um, and it's like, you know, it's, it's an S3 method, so it's unexported. So you have to do like the triple columns. And if you look at it, it, it takes a ggplot and initializes a new canvas and then actually builds the plot and then draws the plot that you built and then returns the ggplot object back to you invisibly, um, which is why like, you know, plotting is just a side effect of printing a ggplot object. Um, and so that nuance is kind of lost uh, when we as users think about what we think we're doing when we're writing ggplot code. And so the value that we're looking for, again, is not in our ggplot object. We have to, um, you know, use functions like layer data to look at the values that are being plotted. And then, you know, you'll kind of have to dig in um, and look at things like, you know, these columns are, this is kind of like the, the drawing ready data for the layer. Um, and so you will find the value for how far this whisker extends down to in the second row of the Y min column. So it's like 178 is the exact value where this whisker extends down to. And that's like a lot of steps to, a lot of hoops to jump through just to be like, hey, what's this value of, uh, what's, what's this thing that I just plotted? <laughs> Which is like something that's like very trivial and very reasonable question that the user might ask about, but then you have to learn how ggplot internals work to get that. Um, and incidentally, is this where you would go to access that value if you wanted to yeah. put on the on the plot itself? Yeah, so it's very it's very like counterintuitive because you might think that the ggplot object contains all the information that's needed to draw things, and that's true, but like in a very specific sense. So ggplot object just has the instructions for plotting, but looking at the values that were calculated requires you to build the plot up to the point where it is calculated. So um, if you recall, the layer data function actually runs ggplot build and then grabs the data. And this is essentially like running the plot halfway through, like building the plot halfway and then grabbing the, the data where the stat has transformed it, um, which is like very, um, this, is, this is an analogy that I was kind of toying around with, but it didn't make it to my user talk, and I don't think it'll make it to my RStudio conf talk. But a way of thinking about it is like ggplot. Uh, you can think of the ggplot object as kind of like a recipe and like ingredients. So that would be like the, the code and the data is like the recipe and ingredients. Um, and say it's for like a pasta. So like the ggplot object is recipe for a pasta. The actual ggplot figure is like the, the cooked pasta itself, you know, like with with the actual cooked noodles and the tomato sauce and everything. Um, and if you're trying to look at the value of things like, you know, the, what's the value of the lower whisker, that's kind of like asking, um, what, does, what does the pasta noodles taste like right after it's been cooked, but before the sauce was put on it? You know, so it's like, an, it's, you're asking a question about an intermediate step where that step is kind of lost um, by the end, and it's also not available at the beginning. So it's like it was temporarily there, it exists for a second, and then it gets garbage collected, and now you can't really access it unless if you, you know, make the pasta from scratch, and then you kind of say like, stop, I boiled the pasta, I'm going to taste it now, okay, move on. Um, and then that, that analogy is kind of interesting because um, you can think of uh, those, if you've ever looked at like Stack Overflow, there's questions that are asking about like how to tweak like very small parts of a plot and they like go digging into like ggplot as like a grob, like ggplot graphical object. Um, and they start doing like really crazy stuff. So I think I can actually demonstrate. Um, so this is, if you, the ggplot graph function basically 
gives you the plot, but like not as a side effect. So this is like if you if you printed if you drew this, then it is your ggplot figure. ggplot grab is a function that returns you the actual graphical object of ggplot, and it looks something like this. Um, and then you might be like, can you? You would have to do something along the lines of like this. To like it's it's crazy, but uh, um, some something like this to get to a point where you can pinpoint the the whisker object and try to like backform like its data values from the coordinate points. And um, the fact that some people do this um, can be translated into our pasta making analogy as kind of like trying to figure out what the noodles taste like without the sauce. Uh, by taking the cooked pasta with the sauce in it and just kind of like washing it off in the sink and then eating the pasta without the sauce, which is like insane. Um, and I think that's like a very good analogy because people who 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 write code like this to to look at an intermediate step in the internals is is insane, um, but not in like a bad way. They're just like really good at grid, which is, is you know, you can't you don't you don't get good at grid by being a sane person. <laughs> um, but yeah, so. So we so so there's there's this like you know a lot of stuff that we care about happen in the internals that are not accessible um, that are very counterintuitive to access. Um, so that's like where we're at in terms of like you know things that go on in the internals, why users should care about the internals. So that's like a, a problem oriented um, kind of you know point about why users should might want to know about the internals. There's like there's also another part where it's like more solution oriented um, point about why users might want to know about the internals, which is that this this value that we saw about the value of the lower whisker, like 178 is the lower whisker for here. If we want to go and like label this on the plot, which like, you know, some people might want to do as part of their like data analysis workflow, they might want to annotate their box plots. So that's perfectly reasonable. and it's not like a really crazy esoteric thing that developers care about. It's like something that the user might care about. So we can, you know, we can do this by just like going into layer data. So like make plot first and then make it halfway um, until the value that we care about becomes available, visually inspected, like copy paste into here and then be like, you know, y equals this, x equals. Actually, don't know if this works. Label. So we can do this, which is doing it very manually. I don't know why my plot doesn't print. There you go. Um, so, so we can do this as users, where if we care about, if we want to, like, you know, interact with something that happened internally, we can just like, just like build this plot like halfway and then look at what's available midway. Um, but we can also do something that's like this on the fly without having to go searching for it in the internals first. So you can write code that is again, like very crazy. which should give us the same thing. <laughs> so um, this is like, this is um, this, I, I like this example because it, it makes use of um, these functions like stage and after stat, which are like relatively new functions that give users more control um, in terms of interacting with things that happen in the internals as they happen. Um, so you probably like never seen like ggplot code that's written like this before and and that's for like there's a good reason for that which is that 
this code is basically impossible to read or write unless you have a mental model of how the internals work, which the users aren't supposed to know. So like, how are you supposed to read code like this, write code like this if you're a user and not a developer who doesn't know the internals? So there's like, you know, again, this weird tension where users, the capabilities of the users keep expanding because ggplot keeps introducing new features, which are awesome, but then you know, there's not a lot of entries for users to make use of these new new features because, you know, they keep encroaching on the internals territory. Um, so then, you know, this is another reason why you might want to know about the internals as users. Uh, the reason why code layer code like this is a lot more difficult than layer code like this is not just in like the amount of code that's written, but it's actually in this more fundamental concept of how we think about layers, like what we think layers are doing. So when we when we write layer code like this and like think about layer code like this, we can get away with thinking about a layer as just doing like one one big thing. So we might read code here as something like, hey geom box plot, here's like all the stuff that you need. Now I provided it for you, do your thing. And so when we write and reason about code like this, we can get away with thinking about a layer as just doing like one big thing. And our job as users is to just provide the function with everything that it needs up front, and then it will just do whatever it takes to draw a box plot for you. It becomes difficult to maintain this simple view of how layers work once you start looking at code like this and writing code like this, because this code reads more like um it's more along the lines of something like this so when you write this code this code says something like hey layer remember that data that i gave you to plot which is the original penguins data apply this function to it first and then proceed as normal with flipper length map to y and then when the box plot stat steps in and transforms the data use the computed y min variable to remap to the Y aesthetic and do the same to the label aesthetic. And then after you're done with that, use the label geom to draw what you have. So this is very confusing because we're making references to steps in the internals that we as users don't get to see. So this kind of violates our assumptions about layers as just doing one big thing. It's like a single stage process. But then for us to read and write code like this, we have to you know, do this like work of thinking multiple steps ahead and um, making references to steps in the internals that we actually don't have access to. So it's like very confusing. It's like there's a lot of like, you know, cognitive overload happening here for code like this. Does it also does it also make ggplot do the same steps twice once when it's creating my box plot and then again when it's trying to pinpoint that that y min value? No, no. So this is why it's awesome because you're you're these instructions kind of um, are like put into action at the appropriate steps as you're building the layer. Uh, um, and so this is, you know, like, it's not like after the fast fact post hoc, like, okay, you've done this natural course of doing everything at once. And then now you're going back and revising things. Instead, it's like, it's, it's wrong to think that everything happens at once to begin with. It always happens in steps. But we don't usually reference internal steps because they're so coherent and they're so invisible. Uh, we don't think about them. Like we don't think about the fact that you know geom box plot has a stat equals box plot by default. And so we can we we can read you know layer functions like this in steps. Like hey layer, take the data, start with fill our species map to fill and x, and then flipper length map to y. Uh, and then apply the box plot stats transformation first, and then use the internally calculated variables and pass it to G on box plot and then have it draw a box plot. We can, you know, we can reason about every layer in this way of going through it like step by step, but we we don't we don't have to, and that's actually a good thing about ggplot. We don't have to think in in steps like that that makes it very easy on us as users, but then that can kind of also get us into you know wrongly thinking that things are so simple and if we kind of get stuck in that mindset we can't really take advantage of 
all the things that are possible for us to do as users. So this this is very powerful because um, it makes us it lets us interact with different steps in the internals as they happen. Um, but then, you know, they're they're very hard to reason about. Um, yeah, so so what I would like is, and maybe this is getting meta, but something that the book doesn't really talk about, but something that I think would be really beneficial for anyone, like even if they're just planning to stay as users, um, is like the, the bare minimum knowledge of the internals necessary to write code like this. And then that can be like a like a jumping point to like writing extensions instead of having this bigger gap between users and aspiring developers. We can have users and then like power users and then aspiring developers. Um, so we don't like jump into ggproto and all that all that jazz right away because you don't need to know like ggproto and, and ggproto methods and stuff too to think about stuff like this. Um, so June, I have, I have one more question. Um, I was just looking at the stage function and trying to understand what stage mm -hmm. was. And it mentions ggplot2 has three stages of the data that you can map aesthetics from. The default is to map at the beginning using the layer data provided by the user. The second stage is after the data has been transformed by the layer stat. The third and last stage is after the data has been transformed and mapped by the plot scales. So does when you use this stage function there in line 24, mm -hmm. You, uh, how are you specifying which stage? Ah, uh, sorry, implicit uh, argument order. Start and then after stat. Oh, uh, okay. This argument is the start. So stage is like start with flipper length map to Y, proceed as normal until after the statistical transformation step, step at which point use the computed variable Y min to remap it to Y. Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> which is the only stage really that you have Y min. You don't have it before stat. Exactly. And, and it's it's been garbage swept after this stage. Mm -hmm. So right now is the only time that you really have Y min. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and you don't you don't really know that until you actually go inside the internals and check it out, which is right. kind of like what my R Studio comp talk is going to be. Yeah, you don't, really, you don't really know that until you have a, a sit down with June to go through. <laughs> but, yes. Yeah, but what you'll realize is this is like still you're still working with data frame. Everything's everything's data wrangling. Everything that the user needs to know about the internals to write and understand code like this is still within the realm of just data wrangling. Yeah. Um, and I guess briefly to your point about like stage, um, actually like anytime we we write like an we, we map an, a, a variable to an aesthetic. This is implicitly just stage start equals species. You just you just don't like change it. <laughs> so anytime you map an aesthetic, conceptually, you're staging an aesthetic uh, or you're staging a variable um, and saying start with species map to fill, but then you're not like remapping to the fill aesthetic. Um, but then you can, if you want, by using the after stat and after scale, scale arguments of stage. Um, so again, everything can be written like this, uh, and you can reason about what a layer is doing in steps, but usually things are implicit. So like, you know, this stage start equals species is implicit, stat equals box plot is implicit. Um, if you have like G on bar, where like, um you can provide like one aesthetic one mapping to like x or y and then it will derive counts for the other axis um so like you only gave it a species map to x but then it calculates counts and um and maps it to the y for you that also has the implicit um step of mapping y to after stat count Right, which is the same as uh, start with, so stage, start with not having anything mapped to the Y aesthetic, start with just the X, wait until the stat has stepped in and then derive the count variable from the X aesthetic mapping, 
And then after the stat has stepped in and you have count available, then use that to, you know, for to map to the y axis, y, y aesthetic. And then that gives you the plot. So like everything can be thought about in this way, but then you it's it's implicit. You don't really have to think about it. But then it's kind of useful to think about it even if you just plan to stay a user, uh, because that can um, help you in doing a lot of things. So that that kind of leads me to, I know everything was like very abstract, but that kind of leads me to um, you know, exactly what you're talking about, Ryan. Like how can we how can we actually see these things happen um, as users? Um, and that's where you know, through some trial and error, I've kind of identified four stages in the internals where we, um, where where we can consult the stage of the data at certain steps in the internals for us to write code like this. Um, so I've called it like before stat stage, after stat stage, before geom stage, and after scale stage. So for our box plot, our raw data is looks like this. You know, as it's a data set of penguins, it has columns for species and bill length, which we're using for our plots. And then the final drawing ready form of this data, oops, drawing ready data uh, for the box plot layer looks like this. It has like a, a bunch of columns, but there are intermediate steps that ggplot code like this can reference. So one intermediate step is the before stat stage. Which looks like this. So by this point, you have, you know, the scale transformation. So you have y is the same because we have scale y continuous default. Um, X it has been transformed into integers so that you can draw things in the continuous coordinate space. Um, and you have fill here. They haven't this the fill scale hasn't applied, but the positional scales X and Y is applied. Um, you have these new columns like panel and group, which you can think of as like metadata for keeping track of which observations go together. So like in this case, which rows in your data are for which box plots. Um, and so if you did something here, like do a different scale transformation, scale Y log 10, then um, you know, the scale transformation for Y is also where, um, this is the point where you can also see the scale transformations like log transform for for the Y aesthetic. So this is, this point for stat point is important because they, um, they, they inform what kind of stat that you can use. So if you have provided fill X and Y aesthetics, you can use things like the box plot stat because stat box plot requires X or Y. Um, if you have X and Y, you can also use like stat identity, which is what's used for like geom point um, because you have, you know, X and Y and you can use that for uh, drawing points. Um, I think this X and Y also give you access to like geom call, um, except they'll all be stacking. But yeah, this, this stage of the data you can use to, this is what, what you can look at to to choose a stat um, so like this geom label layers choice of stat box plot is validated by the fact that the before stat data has x and y present which are you know and 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 stat box plot requires one of those i think so like um if you instead made like a box plot with like only a fill aesthetic then the data at this point will look like this so you only have fill available but not x or y and then it errors at stat box plot because it requires an x or y aesthetic mapping and so the fact that whatever is available in the before stat stage the the stat for the layer is looking at the columns it, at this point in the data and looking like do I have everything that I need um, and if I don't have an x or y then I'm going to error if I do have an x or y that's satisfied so I'm going to move on and then the next thing that we care about as users is the inspect after stat stage so for 
our box plot, that stage of the data would look like this. So we got like a whole lot of columns here. Basically, every, all of these columns, all of this is from after the stat stage. Um, so stat is usually the, 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 the part of the internals that does like bulk of the work. Um, and so you can see between the before stat and the after stat, um, in the after stat, it's, it's, it's like a group by and summarize. So you only have three rows in the data and each row represents a box plot. So it's like, it's, it's just group by and summarize. It's still kind of like tidy data. Each row is a box plot. The columns are like aesthetics that describe each box plot. Um, and you have computed variables that, um, that, that are values for different components of the box plot that's going to be drawn. This after stat part is important because they tell you what kind of variables are available for mapping in the after stat which you can access through either the after stat function or the after stat argument of stage. So what allows us to write things like after stat y min or just after stat y min is the fact that our after stat data has these variables calculated for us. Um, if we uh, do another plot like geom bar, so let's say, and then geom bar x equals species. Then by this point, it again is like tidy data. So it summarized our data such that each row is a bar and columns are aesthetics describing each bar. And it has calculated variables for us like count and prop. And so the reason why the geom bar can do, you know, y equals after stat count is because the count variable is a column, a variable that's available in this after stat stage of the data in the internals. It's so like the after stat snapshot of the data has a variable called count. That's how we know that we can use it to map to, um, you know, our uh, map to a plot aesthetic um, in the after stat. So, so after stat, these kind of functions like after stat and after scale is just like a pointer, like it points to a data frame um, at that that only exists temporarily um, in the in the course of the data becoming drawing ready, um, and so it's it's just like regular kind of aesthetic mappings of columns to uh, aesthetics, um, except after stat just says look for the count variable not in the original penguins data but in this after stat data where you do have columns like count available. And then there's um, another point uh, after the after the after stat stage. Um, the third kind of snapshot that we care about as users is what I'm calling the before geom stage. So just like how before stat is useful because um, this is the state of the data that validates your choice of stat. The before geom is the state of the data that validates your choice of geom. And so in this case, in the before geom, you have the after stat or the, the yeah, after stat mapping applied. So you do get a Y variable um, for our geom bar, uh, which we need to draw, um, use the bar geom because geom bar as a layer requires, or geom bar as a geom requires both X and Y, and you can see that in the documentation, wherever that is. Geom bar required aesthetics are in bold. It requires X and Y. So it was a problem um, when the, the count stat that's used by geom bar calculated count for us, but we don't have a Y yet. But then because we have this after stat or this Y equals after stat count default for geom bar, we get a Y column before, right before uh, our data validates the geom. So at this stage, we have it. Um, if we did something like set Y equals null, so that like you never have a Y aesthetic, then you won't have a Y available in the before geom stage. And so when geom bar looks at the state of the data in the before geom stage, and sees that it doesn't have the Y aesthetic that it needs, then it will error at this point here. Um, and 
the the kind of nice thing about before geom is that it's this is or the the nice thing about the after stat i should say is that if if there is a missing link between a stat and a geom like the stat doesn't give you all the variables that are necessary to for the for the geom to step in um and use for plotting then you can use after stat to kind of um as kind of like a glue that that holds them together um so for example um in the after stat geom bar calculated variables like this geom bar needs a y so then using the the default y equals after stat count we get y available before it's sent off to the geom we can also add other columns so like aesthetic mappings are basically mutate <laughs> um so we can be like label equals after stat which will give us oops a label column in the after stat or in the in the before geom before it's sent off to the geom right now we're using geom bar and then it complains because geom bar doesn't understand it but we can use like geom label um and then keep the stat count and so geom label is a, a geom that requires x y and label to work um and so by making label and y columns um available for the geom in the before geom stage like this the label geom can step in and be like oh i have y i have label i have x that's enough for me to draw a label and so our plot will end up looking like this where we have labels um where the instead of bar heights for our bars so we can actually do something like this uh, spell out the defaults for geom bar here. Oops. Why did I miss plus sign? So this will give us bars and like annotations for the bars. Um, and the one difference is uh, in geom label, if we want to use geom label to annotate the counts, we can keep the same stat. Like the choice of stat is what determines what variables are available in the after stat. So because we use stat equals count in both cases, we can do y equals after stat count. The thing that's missing if we want to change from geom bar to geom label is that geom label needs a label column a label aesthetic for it to draw like annotate actual labels and so we have to give it um provide it uh to our data provide a make a label column mutate make a label column um that's the same as count um as count after count is created in or available in the after stat stage of the data so yeah, again, this is basically, this kind of aesthetic mapping is basically the same as if we took the after stat of of this, and then did like mutate y equals count label equals count and then I'll give you or I'll give you this data oh that actually looked kind of weird this is the same thing as y equals after stack count label equals after stack count so mappings to Mapping to aesthetic is just mutating, creating new columns in the underlying data frame representation of the layer. Um, and then, so so the order, the, the big order kind of goes like this. You have the initial aesthetic mappings, which is kind of like, like created by AES, which you can also think of like start, 
So that's like step one. And then step two is like validating the stat. And step three is opportunity to create more columns with after stat. And then step four is validating the geom. And then step five is opportunity to create more columns with after scale. And I should say create or modify. Yeah. Um, and this kind of, uh, the, the fact that like aesthetic mappings kind of work like mutate is neat because this allows us to also do stuff like this, um, where, you know, Y can be count, but then we can be like sneaky and make the annotation actually, the value of the annotation is like 10 larger than what the count is. So like this will give us a data frame that looks like this, where the label is arbitrarily higher. Um, and so it'll give us values like 134 for this point, even though that should be like a little bit up here. Um, so yeah. Um, and then of course, another thing that we can do is again, this is like, like mutate. So we can do like count over some count, which is basically the same thing as like this vector. Like doing a vector operation on each values of count divided by the total number of counts across all species, which will give you like proportions. So that will give you these values that are derived from the count column. And then the graph itself would, you know, look like this. So like, you know, 40 something percent, 44% of penguins in our, in our data set are Adelie penguins um, instead of counts of like 100, I guess, 52. Yeah. Uh, and then I guess the last part that we care about users is the after stat, which I think is the, the most straightforward. So inspect after or after scale, sorry, after scale. And I'll actually keep using the, the geom bar one because that one doesn't produce as many columns. The, the state of the data after after like non-positional scales have applied. So like, for example, fill, like you get defaults for fill now. I think if we also like explicitly map to fill, this is the point where you get like the actual hex values for, for the fill. Um, after scale, the, the data in the after scale stage is also a point where the user can interact with it. So in the after scale, you have columns like fill available and they are the, the fill columns are actually like color hex color values. Um, and so if we plot this, it will give us, you know, in default colors, the um, bars, it will fill the bars like that. Um, if we give it like a color of say like black, it will draw like an outline. If we wanted to um, like color or outline the bars in a color that's like a darker version of their fill color, then you can say color equals after scale, color equals grab the, um, the fill, fill column from the after scale data after scale snapshot of the data, um, except also like darken it, uh, say by like 0.5. Now will give us a, a plot that looks like this, uh, which is again, this is, Aesthetic mappings are just like mutate. You're you're creating columns internally, um, and so what we just did here is the same thing as uh, grabbing our data 
here just say like after scale or after scale data and then making a new column where color equals darkened version and so you get these hex values for color and then and and so like this is the this is now like the data that gets sent off to the drawing system and then I'll, I'll look inside and be like oh we have colors uh for the bars so i'm gonna use it um so yeah that's that's kind of how it works um and then notice how like at this point you also have like other defaults available so in the before the geom steps in you don't have columns like color size line type alpha because that's columns that are added by the geom because those are relevant for what's being drawn and then different geoms will add different columns for you so we have things like line type for that's added by geom bar because geom bar has outlines um, but like geom text will not have a line time call line type column but it will have like you know i guess i'm actually not sure what it does have maybe it will have like font face and stuff so we can we can just check geom, geom text so this will give us a plot that looks like this after geom text steps in it will after scale yeah it will give us you know columns like angle h just and v just which are specific to the geom um, but then the before geom will look like this um, and notice how before geom you have these columns and then after scale, which is kind of like after geom, except I call it after scale because after geom is technically like after things are drawn, but after scale is still within, we're still dealing with data frames. We have values like these in the after scale. We could just like do something very crazy where you now we have something like this. We know that um in the after scale we have values like this um we can grab let's say like i wonder if we can like size after scale like after scale size will grab it from the data we can I think we can do something like after scale size equals size times like like two. So this will make like the text twice as bigger than it was originally going to be, which is also something that a lot of people wonder how you can like go about doing that. And like the the traditional answer is like, oh, look at like the defaults for you know like like you know like geom geom text like this will. Like somewhere in the source code, it will tell you that the default size that geom text uses is 3.88. If you want to, you know, like remember that or go look at that. But if you want to do something as simple as just like do my plot, but now this time with text twice as large, you you know, there is you you can do something like this, but then this requires some knowledge of the internals. But this is very handy, right? Where you can make it like 50% bigger. Yeah. Do you have thoughts, Ryan? Yeah, I have thoughts. I'm trying to like kind of put them into a into a sentence. So, I mean, this is going to be super obvious, but all these things that you're showing right here, like how to make the the um, the font twice as big, or how to make darken the the color around the bars, or even when you showed the percentage instead of the raw number 152, it was you know 0.44 as a percentage. So like, I think if I needed to do any of those things, I would probably spend some time looking it up online and then find some stack overflow. And I'm sure there would be some kind of um, what appears now to be like a workaround where they would say, um, you know, access this particular argument of a, of a function 
Um, but what it seems like is understanding the internals like you've gone through right here um, opens up like a much wider ability to make these kinds of changes. And instead of like, instead of going online and finding particular steps or a technique or a workaround that somebody else has come up with, you have in front of you like all of the, all of the data and you just learn to manipulate the columns of a data set that is very transitory and, and you add a column because you need to darken the color or you you um, you adjust a column like this where you have in line 110 size after scale size times 1.5 so instead of instead of needing a different technique that you find online you just have everything in front of you this way um, yeah is that yeah yeah that's kind of like the big takeaway at least for yeah. I guess, you know, yeah. or Studio Conf and other times I'll be talking about ggplot internals or the ggtrace package. Yeah. It's like, yeah, like we, ggplot internals has a lot of things, but then, you know, we can abstract away from like the really gory details like ggproto and, you know, efficient programming and base R functions and stuff. And just like focus on big data frames, which we're already very familiar with. And that can get you very far because as far as like, because like the reason why we don't have to think about drawing is because like we can think about the stage up until drawing, which is making a data drawing ready like this. And then the drawing system will just, all it looks at is just like the data by the time it receives it. And the user has some kind of, con some, some control over how this data gets shaped before it's sent off to the drawing system. So if we, you know, change the Y min to be like 200 for somehow, for whatever reason, then that will get reflected in the plot. And we don't have to think about how that gets drawn, but we still get some kind of control over what gets drawn. Yeah. Um, and, and you don't have to write another function or do some other, like add some extra line into the, um, into the code or whatever. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's all here, <laughs> just in ggplot code. Yeah. Um, a separate question on this inspect after scale and all these inspect functions. Did you are these just coded here or are these part of the GG trace package? These are not part of the package. I they're they're wrappers around um, oh, GG trace okay. functions. So um, and that's because like when I when I talk about like snapshots of the data at different steps, that's when I like inevitably have to like interact with GG proto methods because you know it is data wrangling like you know it's like data wrangling all the way down but then what what actually implements that are ggproto methods so uh one way to kind of hide the fact that there are ggproto methods is to write a wrapper around this mm -hmm. basically like the before stat stage is like the input to this ggproto method the after stat stage is the output of this ggproto method before geom is the input to this one after scale is the output of this one and so if you recall like this is actually how ggplot internals are written where you have this kind of like continual like assignment back to this data <laughs> variable inside the internals where it's like you take the data you know do something to it and you know assign it back um, and so yeah these kind of functions let you kind of intercept the data um, in this data transformation pipeline, essentially. Um, and that, that's all we need to do because we have functions like after scale and after stat to let us um, modify, like hijack the, the pipeline and make it do different things, create new columns, modify new columns. But then for us to make full use of that, we need to be able to inspect it. But then paradoxically, the, the simpler task of like inspecting what goes on is not available, but the more powerful um, tool of changing what goes on in the internals is available through these functions. Um, yeah, which I think is kind of a missed opportunity because like, yeah, like stuff like this is something that even I knew very recently um, and something that I just like never find people talking about as just like, how do I make something slightly larger than it was going to be without like, you know, grabbing the actual value that it was drawn with. Super cool. cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably have like a 
actual write up of, of this. This is still kind of in progress, but yeah. Bravo. <laughs> But yeah, I hope. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I think this is this is actually wonderful. Never never thought about these things in this detail. So <laughs> this was uh, very interesting. I think I'm gonna be trying all these different data sets. Uh, for me, I think it's uh, personally I I feel empowered when you know you can see internally what's going on. So I'm definitely gonna be looking into these. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, now, you know, based on the discussion that John had, and I guess I wanted to throw out just an idea of, do we want to continue uh, and, and try and discuss chapter, the last chapter on case study? Um, to me, it seemed very complicated. I, I don't know. If, I, I don't have the capacity to digest it and discuss. Um, I, I don't know what all of you think. Hmm. Uh, do we do we want to take up that chapter? Do we want to do it offline, like June was suggesting, like discuss it on GitHub? Um, and then I, I think uh, additional to this this question, I also want. I mean, I think this idea just came to me today. Was uh, if we you know we want to continue to meet, uh, there's something else that we can do is probably so we finished entire ggplot right now. Um, so relating to ggplot are those extension packages. Um, GG Trace is one, GG Easy, GG Themes, I think. Uh, would it be, uh, you know, worth an effort to maybe take up uh, one or two sessions in, in the follow up weeks to maybe have someone talk about those um, extra additional packages that could enhance your, um, you know, uh, uh, existing ggplot to code? Um, well, I mean, if anyone is interested, um, just throwing out an idea. Yeah, honestly, maybe like, you know, we could, we could like table, you know, like this book club could, you know, end here, but then we could definitely start like another reading group or something where we just like talk about extension packages, and other sure. packages that are useful. Yeah, I'm, I'm not opposed to that. I, <clears throat> I am still like several chapters behind as far as going through the ggplot book itself and wanted to take some time to catch up on that and, and practice with like tidy Tuesday data and stuff. So um, that would be my, I would, I would agree with that. We can definitely pick it all up after a breather. Mm. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so what about the case study? Ryan, what do you think? Uh, for my part on the case study, I, I would say the same thing. I'm, I'm just going to go back and try to um, improve my skills on what we've covered so far. Uh, I don't, for my part, I'm not, uh, you know, about to jump into the case study. Um, so, okay. But if you guys are, are, don't let me stand in your way, so. Yeah, no, Federica, what do you think? Um, I think we can use June uh, uh, talk of today as a case study. And then uh, yeah. let's, let's think about if we want to do it. Uh, we catch up on Slack. I don't know. I'm not sure about that now. Okay, sure. Yeah, we'll, we'll catch up. Yeah, I, I also, I think, find it too heavy for me to um, uh, even talk about it at the moment. But yeah, we can, we can as a group, finalize on the Slack channel. And uh, I guess if, if we do not continue, this might just be our last meeting. Which again, I, you know, I, I should take this, that as an opportunity to thank all of you, uh, you know, to gather together and discuss uh, this entire book. Um, I don't know. I've never <laughs> done the formal spiel <laughs> or or be part of. Um, I, I mean, I've been part of other book clubs, but uh, yeah, I guess that's that's how I would wrap up. Um, so we'll we'll flow, we'll finalize on. Uh, on Slack, um, if we want to take up the case study or not, I think most of us are rather leaning on doing it offline. Um, and then, yeah, I guess uh, we'll we'll also, as a group, maybe catch up some some time again and discuss the extension packages, uh, because I think uh, it's it's a lot of fun uh, when when I see those some people using those, you know, sharing it on on Twitter or otherwise, um, just how 
how you can refine or enhance your existing um, ggplot2. I think one of the examples for, like, for example would be like you have a plot about, I don't know, cats, and then you're talking about, you add in those pictures, um, then there is, I think, uh, where you can annotate things, gg annotate or something like that. But yeah, it, it'll be, I think, interesting to uh, just go over those. It, it may not be too long, maybe a session or two might be enough, but it's it's just interesting to see the possibilities um, that are out there. I, I don't deny that this is a good idea because I, I like the idea to do a couple of sessions on, uh, I don't know, like things that we are working on and uh, explain to the others, maybe focalizing on one or two arguments that we like to improve a bit more than others. But yeah, the, uh, yeah let's think about it. Uh, um, I like the idea. Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. So I think we're on the top of the hour. So um, we, we would wrap this discussion today and uh, we'll, we'll catch up and decide on our final um, closure um, in the Slack. Uh, so with that, I think thank you so much again, and we will will be in touch on Slack and potentially on another book club. <laughs> See you till then. Thank you. Bye, -bye. and thank you so much again, June. Thanks. Thank you everyone thank for you. your participation. Bye. 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 Oh, bye.